From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Suyini Gray. We start in Paraguay, where the ruling Colorado party has just won the presidential election, with over 99% of the ballots counted. The results point towards another five years of conservative and neoliberal policies. Mario Abdel Benitez, a 46-year-old former senator, took 46.7% of the vote, according to the country's electoral court. His main rival, Efrain Allegri, a lawyer from the center-left co coalition, was just four points behind, with 42.7%. It was the closest result in a presidential election since the end of the dictatorship 29 years ago. We will honor the trust of the people of Paraguay. We will work with honesty, with integrity, and with sacrifice to give it our all. Today, the divisions in Paraguay have ended. Today, the debate ends. The people have decided. Tomorrow arises a Paraguay that is united. I will dedicate myself to uniting the Republic of Paraguay. Paraguay's Colorado Party was set up by the dictator Alfredo Stroessner and was the country's ruling party from 1947 to 2008. The new president, Abdo Benitez, is the son of Stroessner's right-hand man. He studied in the United States and was an officer in the Air Force and inherited a fortune from his father. As the vote was underway, some Paraguayans said they wanted a new government to improve public health and education. On a day when over two and a half million Paraguayans cast their ballots, the most common concerns of citizens were the lack of decent education and health services as well as influence peddling in the judicial system. We can no longer postpone fundamental changes in the judicial systems and in the social outlook of the government. I think that during the past five years the poor were forgotten, with big businesses getting all the attention. According to the UN's Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, Paraguay is the country with the least social investment in the region. Voters hope that the majority will be kept in mind when implementing public policies to improve the quality of life. We need better policies for the people, for those in need, especially when it comes to health and education, which currently are the weakest areas in our country. With an advantage of 3.7 points over his closest rival, Mario Abdo Benitez was elected president. The former senator and defender of the military dictatorship comes to power as the son of the man who was the private secretary to the dictator Alfredo Stroessner for 35 years. I have many people to thank for today, but I can't forget my father, who was a great Colorado. This is a tribute to our kids and to future generations. Paraguay is still waiting to digest the final makeup of the two houses of Congress. But what is clear is that the political party that was responsible for the longest dictatorship in South America will now enjoy a new period in the presidency. In Asuncion, our correspondent Adriana Sivori has more on the presidential election. The ruling Colorado Party candidate Mario Abdo Benitez won Sunday's presidential election. The opposition candidate Efraín Alegre said he will wait for the official count to end to congratulate Abdo Benitez, although he has recognized Abdo Benitez as the likely winner. Alegre ended up just three points behind the winner, and thanks to this, the opposition has said they have become a new force of change for the country. This is the first time in the history of Paraguay that an electoral race has such a tight result. An important issue raised by analysts regards previous polls, since these apparently showed that Abdo Benitez was up 20 points, but the official results have told a different story. The left-wing parties are waiting for the legislative results, since they hope to win more seats than in previous elections. For now, the left-wing force has taken five seats, but they expect to win at least seven seats in order to change the country's political scenario. Corruption and security were the main focus at the first presidential debate in Mexico. According to surveys, Andres Manuel López Obrador is 20 points ahead of his nearest challenger, Ricardo Anaya.
Anaya and Jose Antonio Mead are battling each other for the second position, while the two independent candidates, Margarita Zavala and Jaime Rodriguez, have less than 10%. During the debate, Anaya proposed giving better training to the police to enhance security, while Mead vowed to take a tough stance on criminals. Lopez Obrador said Mexico's main problem is corruption and that he wants to fight the causes of violence in the country. Mexico is holding its presidential elections on July 1st. To formalize and certify all police is something very important. To continue to have the support of the army and marines until we have police that are reliable and who are on the side of the people. The objective of my government is to defend Mexicans, to defend you from the corrupt, to defend you from criminals, to defend you from U.S. President Donald Trump, and to defend you from the abusive political parties. A great part of national security is not to create populist policies. How are you, López Obrador, going to explain to families that you want to sit down with these criminals and hold dialogue with your ambition for power and your fear of losing again? You have become a puppet for criminals. I will put them in jail. It has been claimed that I want to release all criminals from prison that have committed a crime. What I consider is that we have to tackle the regions, the causes of violence. Corruption is Mexico's main problem. Nothing has hurt the country more than the dishonesty of those governing. And our Mexico City correspondent Pablo Perez has the latest reactions on this first debate. So five candidates took part of the first presidential debate here in Mexico with 70 more days to go until election day on July 1st where Mexicans are going to vote for the next president. So far, the opinions in social networks are a little disappointed by the tone of this debate where the uh, analysts counted as much as 46 attacks between candidates and only two governmental proposals. In a debate that covered such urgent issues such as corruption, impunity and security, which are the, uh, the issues that matter the most for the Mexican people. So far, we still haven't seen the effect this is going to have in the polls, but uh, it, it, it seems for the analysts that the campaigns are going just as they started. It's, they are based on uh, dirt, uh, throwing dirt against other candidates instead of proposing new projects for this country. The electoral campaign in Venezuela for the presidential elections on May 20th has officially started with a launch on social media. Tuitazo, or the Twitter campaign in support of Nicolás Maduro, was launched at 6 o'clock in the morning, local time in Venezuela. The hashtags became the most popular Twitter trend in the country, with online messages of support like these. And on the ground in the streets of Caracas, the president's campaign began to disperse throughout the city in support of his candidacy. Why support Nicolás Maduro? Because Nicolás Maduro is synonymous with defense, synonymous with protection, with work, with hope. He has come to represent the hope of the Venezuelan people. We are the hope, we are the future of Venezuela, and above all, we are the majority. That is the moral with which so many people have been out in the streets today in different neighborhoods of the capital, supporting the electoral campaign of President Nicolás Maduro. They also paint murals like this. They will make more than 5,500, which will be discarded all over the capital. Along with the mural, sports and cultural activities have been organized in all neighborhoods in the capital. There has never been a president in this country apart from Chavez who started this revolution to take care of the people the way Nicolas Maduro does. I think that there is not a country in the world where there is a special care for ordinary households, for single mothers, for pregnant women, for the disabled. Today we can say that 100% of older adults have their pension which is from social security. The election campaign will last until May 17th. Beginning today, the candidates will have airtime on TV and radio, as laid out by the National Electoral Council, 
What we are seeing here is being replicated in the 22 parishes of Caracas and in all the municipalities of the country. It is the start of our campaign for the people president. It is the people who will carry the voice of President Nicolas Maduro. Nicolas Maduro will officially begin his campaign on Monday in Puerto Ordaz. Opposition candidates Henry Falcón and Javier Bertucci are also gearing up for the election. Bertucci started this Sunday in the state of Yaracuy, and Henry Falcón began in the island of Margarita with fishermen and traders. We're going to take a short break now, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. The Nicaraguan president, Daniel Ortega, has withdrawn the planned reform of the social security system. The proposal faced five days of violent protests, which left over 20 people dead. Managua, the capital of Nicaragua, rose up after an intense night of pillages. They were encouraged by some groups who are trying to destabilize the government by using violence. The Nicaraguan police is now working to bring the situation back to normal. <laughs> We did the right thing, and that was our mandate. We're going to be tougher on the criminals. Market sellers remain near their stalls to avoid being robbed. Citizens are increasingly worried about the situation. This is bad for all of us. I cannot take a bus to go to work. I have two children. One is a 15-month-old and the other is a 4-month-old. How am I supposed to feed them when there is no food? God help us. Following the violence, President Daniel Ortega withdrew a reform of the social security system. I decided to revoke the 16th of April 2018 resolution on the social security system as it was what triggered this whole situation. Ortega also made a call for peace, unity and dialogue. The table is open so we can all sit down, talk about the issue and share our opinions. Employees, workers, all of us. The dialogue is scheduled to start tomorrow. Representatives of private companies will meet with the government, while the Catholic Church will work as a mediator and as a guarantor of peace. And in Chile, social groups have protested against a private pension scheme known as the AFP. The demonstrators are calling for an end to the management of pensions by private financial institutions. They're demanding the private companies be replaced by a public pension system. It's been more than a year and a half since we came out of the streets screaming no more AFP and asking for improvements to our pension for our compatriots. Despite this, our demands have been dismissed by the authorities. Nothing has changed and nothing will change unless we mobilize. 
The situation we are in today is frankly intolerable. It is an insult to the workers who have dedicated their whole lives to their jobs. They have been in regular employment but can't afford the cost of living. We have been too tolerant of this system for too long. I reject the individualistic capitalist system which only benefits the wealthy. We insist that a public pension system that will benefit the workers must be created. The government says that AFP is very good because it is business. But we don't have high expectations of it. For us, the only alternative is organizing. Through our struggle, through our street protest, we are going to continue to make this demand. We are going to change this model of privatization that will only create greater injustice. An outrage is spreading in Panama as the alleged embezzlement of $300 million from the Social Security Fund is putting retirement programs for disabled and elderly people at risk. The scam was detected after a series of audits in the Social Security Department. It could involve employers who have taken advantage of new benefits system introduced in 2012. The National Assembly has summoned the director of the Social Security Fund, Alfredo Maritz, to answer questions. And Argentina protested yet another electricity rate hike proposed by President Mauricio Macri's administration. This is one of several utility increases over the past two years. People around the country demonstrated against the measure by shutting down their lights for an hour. Protesters also took to the streets holding candles. The government raised energy ta taxes by 45% in December. On Sunday night, Bolivian President Evo Morales arrived in Cuba to meet with the island's new president, Miguel Diaz-Canel. During his stay, Morales will also meet with several new authorities elected last week, and he visited academic and investigation centers to develop new integration projects. And Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, was also in Cuba over the weekend to meet the new president, Diaz-Canel. It was the first official visit to Cuba by an international leader following the election. Maduro congratulated the newly elected president. The Venezuelan delegation included the Minister of Education, Elias Juana, and Foreign Minister, Jorge Ariasa. Both held meetings with their Cuban counterparts. Hoy venimos a renovar la esperanza. Today we are here to renew hope, to renew dreams, and to define our future, to visualize 10 years going forward. What more can be done for our people? And when I say our people, I mean the Cuban people, the Venezuelan people, but I also am speaking about our America, about America Latina, the Caribbean. What more must be done to create a deep and indestructible foundation for the political, spiritual, moral, and above all, the economic union, as that is what is going to cement a true liberation. The independence and liberation of the 21st century will depend on us building a powerful union and an economic union. Following the election of Cuba's new leaders, our correspondent Laura Prada asked people in Havana how they felt about the future. Isel Filiu is a sports journalist in Cuba. She's the woman who President Raul Castro referred to during his closing speech at the National Assembly of Popular Power. I think the speech of General Raul Castro Ruz was really memorable, and it inspired me and others to build a better and strong Cuban society. A few hours after the new president's election on the streets of Havana, Cubans show their trust in the new president and their optimism for the future. It's a historical continuity Diaz Canel has been elected by the Cuban people from the grassroots, by the people who voted in the election. Diaz Canel will take over from Raul Castro as an experienced revolutionary fighter. Assembly members who witnessed this historic day are committed to fulfilling the mandate of the people. Here's what Cuban assembly members have to say. Diaz Canel's speech was really promising. Like he said, his main goal will be to continue the work of the revolution and all the assembly members and the people of Cuba will support that goal. No puede de ninguna manera. Having highlighted the extraordinary work of the government of Raúl, we can only thank him and wish him well. As Diaz-Canel said, to continue with good energy as today's leader of the Cuban revolution. I believe that it was a beautiful speech. I think that we are all not just excited, but pleased at the same time. 
Havana looks calm and peaceful following the election of Miguel Diaz-Canal to the presidency, and this calm will be followed by visits from heads of state and Cuba's many friends. We're going to take another short break, but join us again after another look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Have some respect for the enormous contribution to the economy of this country that's been made by people who migrate here. migration from the Caribbean, from South Asia, from Ireland, into this country over the past 50 years or so, what kind of health service would we have? What kind of education system would we have? What kind of industrial base would we have? What kind of society would we be? What would, would London have been the multicultural capital of the world hosting the Olympics? I think not. I think we would be a much poorer, much less relevant society and relevant country. We need to think about the contribution that's been made and respect people for that contribution that's been made. Now tonight, I shall be joining my colleagues in voting against this bill, partly because of the um, details within the bill on education, on housing, some of the aspects of health and many other details of the bill, but also because of the atmosphere and the message that it sends at this particular time. Let us start from a sense of humanity. Every case is a human story. Every human story has its ups and downs, has its triumphs, has its tragedies. But instead, we have this dog whistle politics of the mantra that every immigrant is an illegal immigrant, every immigrant must somehow or other be condemned, and immigration is the cause of all the problems that we have in our society. A shortage of housing can be dealt with by building houses. It kind of helps. It, the two things go together. Recognising the skills of people and their ability to contribute to our society helps us all. But if we descend into this UKIP-generated, xenophobic campaign, it weakens us all, it demeans us all as a society, and we're all the losers for that. Welcome back. The Prime Minister of Armenia has resigned following days of protest against him. Tens of thousands of people have rallied in the capital of Yerevan in anti-government protests in recent days. Hundreds of soldiers also joined the protesters. They accused the 63-year-old of clinging to power by amending the constitution, which allowed him to be Prime Minister after being President for over 10 years. The French President Emmanuel Macron is to, set to meet the U.S. President Donald Trump at the start of his three-day visit to the United States. Before leaving for Washington, Macron urged Trump to stick to the Iran nuclear deal. In an interview with Fox News, he said that if the deal falls apart, Iran's nuclear problem may become a problem like that as the one in North Korea. In 2017, Trump imposed stricter sanctions on Iran and called the nuclear agreement the worst deal ever. The two leaders are also expected to discuss the situation in Syria. Macron will try to convince Trump on climate change policies and free trade. So my point is to say, even after the end of the war against ISIS, the US, France, our allies, all the countries of the region, even Russia and Turkey, will have a very important role to play in order to create this new Syria and ensure Syrian people to decide for the future. Moving ahead, let's have a look at some other stories making headlines around the world. Taliban insurgents in the western province of Badghis in Afghanistan have attacked and killed 14 soldiers and policemen. 
This comes a day after the Islamic State group targeted a voter center in Kabul, killing 63 people and wounding more than 100. The attack was the latest in a series of assaults on voter registration centers across the country, fueling concern over the impact on turnout in the upcoming parliamentary and district council elections scheduled for October. People are not interested in the election anymore because considering the past years and the current security situation in the country, most people are not willing to attend the election as day by day the situation gets worse. A tour bus crash in North Korea has killed at least 32 Chinese tourists and four North Koreans. Two Chinese tourists have also been seriously injured. The crash happened in North Huanghai province on Sunday night. North Korea is a popular offbeat tourist destination for Chinese people who make up to 80 percent of all tourists in the country. A Belgian court has sentenced Paris attack suspect Salah Abdel Salam and co-accused to 20 years in prison on Monday. The court in Brussels found them guilty of attempted terrorist murder for trying to kill police officers during a shootout in Brussels in 2016 that led to their arrest. Abdel Salam is being held in a jail in France and is due to face trial over the 2015 Paris attacks in which 130 people died. The Federal Let's Assembly in France has passed a stringent law on immigration that tightens the rules on asylum. The new law doubles the Let's detention time for migrants through. whose asylum application Let's is rejected. The they can now be held for 90 days. The law also introduces a one-year prison sentence for entering France illegally and shortens the asylum application deadline. Sculptors in Scotland have been competing in a stone stacking championship for the second year running. More than 30 participants from the United States, Spain, Italy and Britain gathered in Dunbar's Eye Cave Beach. Competitors created complex and gravity-defying sculptures using rocks and pebbles. Some of the sculptures looked as though they were being held up by magic. Really fascinating stuff. We've come to the end of this news brief, but for these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And you should also join us on social media on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. But tell us your English. I'm Sony Gray. Thank you so much for watching.